Good morning, Philippines! I'm back! Kumusta kayo, guys? You know what? I posted this this uh, this video yesterday, pero hindi siya, ewan ko ba nung problema dun? Nakurap yata yung file. So, anyway, I am back. Kumusta kayo? It's actually uh, 6.21 ng gabi here uh, sa Minneapolis. So, it it will be 7.21 in the morning sa Philippines. Good morning po! Sa mga kababayan natin dyan, kumusta na? At saka sa mga immigration officer, mga friends natin. <laughs> anyway, today is actually March 25. Today is Saturday. And it's March 26 in the Philippines. Shout out nga pala sa aking friend. Sir Ian dyan sumagaysay na nasa Florida. And of course, to Cham. Hope you're having a good, good time there. Keep safe, guys. Panay yung, panay yung ano nila, panay, panay yung send, sila, send nila sa akin ng pictures. Sabi niya, wish you're here, how I wish. Kaya lang may mga, tawag dito, may mga responsibilities tayo, may mga appointments tayo na dapat tapusin. So, you know, adulting kong baga. <laughs> anyway, kumusta guys? Wala lang ano, parang hindi ko alam, ano, parang yung weekend ngayon, parang ang dali lang, ang dali lang, passing lang. Parang kailan lang yung Thursday, tapos ngayon Saturday na, bukas mag sa Sunday. Eh kasi ba naman, nung oras na ako nagising, feeling ko lang ha, kasi nga late ako nagising. Usually, alam nyo ba natutulog ako usually 1 o'clock in the morning? So, syempre, pag tulog ka ng 1 o'clock, gising ka ng mga late afternoon or lunch time. So, ilang oras na lang, gabi na, matutulog ka naman ulit. O, di ba? Ay, nako. Anyway, hello to Mark Jaran Alvarez. Hi there. The design is very fresh. <laughs> Hi, Beshi. Hello to Sir Liz King Lester Lintao. Hi, Sir Lester. Kumusta po? How's everybody in the Philippines? I can't wait to go home. Uh, so, I'm planning to go home this coming uh, this coming May, or if not May, uh, last week of June or early of uh, July. Hello to Shildon Banyares. Hi there. Kumusta? A shout out, Doc. Hindi po ako doktor, okay? I'm not a doctor. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a nurse. Natatawa ako dati nung sudyante ko nasa hospital. Shout out sa mga nurses natin dyan sa ano sa 
Ah, uh, taw nito prov- not, not, not provincial sa uh, Hello. Sabi ni Sir Lester Lintao, I'll be there on September. Okay, Sir Lester. Andito lang po ako September. Hope to see you. Nakikita ko yung mga picture mo usually na sa California ka eh. Sana magawi ka dito sa uh, part namin or Central or East Coast. Anyway, balikan natin. Yung sudyante ng sudyante ko naalala ko. Pinatawa ko ng mga pasyente. Dok, 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 dok. Ayan. I always keep I, keep, I keep, I keep, I keep on telling them, hindi pa ako doktor, I'm a nurse. Tapos sabi, ay, nurse po pala kayo, doc. <laughs> doc pa rin, ano? Chicago, sir. Oh, sige po, sige po. I am six hours away from Chicago. So, nasa Minneapolis ako, Sir Lester. Naku, Sir Lester, ano ba? Bigyan mo ko ng schedule, med surge. Kahit na ilang araw, ilang isa o dalawang araw. Anyway, sabi ni Sir Ian, the design is very prequital. <laughs> Alam mo, Besh, wala kang talagang, wala kang na talagang masabing matino. Ano? Mito pa. Thanks for watching, Charm Tuazon. Balita ko, Charm. Ang dami mo mga ano, ang dami, ang ganda ng ano mo, ang ganda ng... Uh, trip niyo diyan sa Orlando, Florida. At saka andito ako sa Minneapolis, 'di ba? <laughs> This time is very baby boys. <laughs> uh, 'di ba? Si Sir Ian, uh, so magaysay siya kasi Sir Cham. <clears throat> nasa ano sila, nasa Universal Studio. You know, I've never been there. Ang napuntahan ko lang na Universal Studio is the Singapore na Universal Studio and then ang napuntahan ko na Disney is Hong Kong uh, yeah Hong Kong Japan yun pero sa ano sa Florida hindi pa sabi ni Sir Ian John the design of Cham is very mukbang eating contest <laughs> ano mismo pinagsasabi niyo guys ano my god alam niyo guys kung, kung alam niyo lang yung mga pictures na pinapadala nila sa akin very educational Oh my God. Hey, Mark. Oy, si Mark pala kasama nila. Tatlo sila nasa Orlando. Si Sir Ian, si Sir Mark, at saka si, tawag nito si Cham. Habol na dito sa Orlando. You know what? Honestly speaking, kanina madaling, kanila madaling araw, siya, di ba, sabi ko, natu- natulog ako ng mga one o'clock. Siguro mga around 12.45, I was scrolling the net. Nagahanap ako ng mga ticket. May ticket from Minneapolis to Florida, Orlando, Florida, dapat kanina ng 10, 10.30 ng umaga. I was actually contemplating to purchase the ticket and then surprise you guys. So, hello, I am here! Pero iniisip ko, oh my God, maging impact na naman ako. Tapos, ilang days lang ako dyan. Tapos, balik na naman dito ng Monday. Parang, napakahasal naman. Tapos, <clears throat> sabi ko, ay, pupunta na kaya ako ng Chicago. Yung Chicago na trip, tinitinitinan ko yung ano, tinitinan ko yung map, oh my God, 6 hours and 30 minutes. Ano yun ha? Private car yun ha? Kung ako magmamanay, 6 hours and 30 minutes. Sabi ko, magkano yung aeroplano? Aeroplano will cost me almost $400. Round trip na yun ha? Tapos yung flight naman will be an hour and 30 minutes. Sabi ko, may train kaya? <clears throat> so, nag- naghanap ako ng train na, 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 tawag nito, na trip. May nakita ko Amtrak. Amtrak. Uh, ang alis niya dito sa Minneapolis almost 9 o'clock in the morning. Tapos, uh, dating niya sa Chicago will be around 4 ng hapon. So, very, very sakto lang. Ano, para pagdating ko ng 4 o'clock doon, pwede na makapag-check-in. So, sabi ko, hindi na nakakapagod. Tapos, I, I can, I, I'm not sure kung magising ako ng 9 o'clock ng umaga. Sabi ni Sir Ian, don't come to Universal. We should just go shop for canes and wheelchairs for future use because the design is very osteoarthritis. <laughs> Alam mo, Ian, dyan sumagaysay. Para sa'yo yan. Can you imagine, guys, you're surrounded with this type of people? Alam mo, plano ko pa naman sana mag-discuss ng nervous system ngayon eh. 
kasi nga hindi na upload yung hindi na upload yung pinost ko kahapon. So parang fini ko ulang discussion na mangyayari ngayong araw. Pag andito yung tatlo na to. Hello to Celestine. Hi to Isabel Becas. Thanks for watching. And hello to Glenda Therule. Hello to Kuya Ron Agabon from Hawaii. Hawaii. Ako, walang, walang discussion na mangyayari ngayon. <clears throat> Hello to my batchmate, Zalette Seed Espejo. Classmate ko yan sa RT. Tama ba ako? Hello to Ralph Yu Cabanlit. Hi there. Kumusta po kayo guys? Nawala, nawala tuloy yung mood ko na mag-discuss. Hello Zalette. Kumusta? Good morning po sir from Celestine. Nasa mundo pa naman ako mag-discuss ng neuro. <clears throat> Sorry. Good morning din sa'yo, Celestine. Besh, ano na? Ano oras yung dating niyo sa Monday? Do you want me to pick you up sa airport? Let me know. Alo, katalang dalawa to. Paray pa yung text sa akin ngayon. Okay. Okay, guys. So, let's continue. So, kaya nga, sabi ko, I, I didn't need to finish this one kasi nga, hindi siya na-upload kahapon. So, as I was saying, we'll talk about nervous system. This concept is one of the most hated concepts in nursing. Why? Because of the complexity of this uh, system, right? I can remember back in the days, during my college days, pag nandidiscuss yung teacher ko dati, ng nervous system. Oh my God, parang, oh my God, ang hirap nito. Kasi nga, inuunahan ko yung sarili ko na, oh my God, this is a, a complicated concept. So, pinungunahan ko siya to the point na parang ayoko nang makinig. You know, I mean, you can relate to that, if ever. So, shout out nga pala sa instructors ko dati sa anatomy physiology. Yung mga instructors ko dati, of course, I have uh, Uh, Mrs. Uh, Ma'am Vinever Alo, si Ma'am Alo, at si Ma'am Obra. And hello to Carla Liana Chua. Hi there, and hello to Chi Ann Cambalon. Ayan. So, yun nga, sabi ko, ano, it's one of the most, hello pa pala, hello to Emerson Goethe. Thanks for watching. So, I will not talk about nervous system in detail, Okay. Yung mga dapat tandaan lang, lalo-lalo na if you're planning to take any qualifying examination. So, this will be very helpful, especially if you are actually starting to uh, answer drills under perception and coordination or drills under neurologic disturbances. You know, my advice to you guys is that before you study medical surgical nursing or any diseases, any disorders, any disturbances, always go back sa basic anatomy and physiology. Why? Because that will serve as your foundation. Remember, anatomy and physiology will talk about normal things, right? So if you don't know what's normal, how will you be able to figure out that that is a form of abnormality if you don't know what normal is, right? 
So that is why ang daming sudyante, ang daming nurses, ang daming mga examiners or actually having a hard time with medical surgical nursing because they don't they don't go back or they have a let's say poor foundation <clears throat> sorry they have a poor foundation with anatomy and physiology so my technique there is go back to basic concept okay anyway hello to Jane Catherine Aguilar Thanks for watching. So yun nga, ano? So your anatomy physiology will serve as your backbone in any nursing concept. Isa yun sa mga technique. Go back to what is basic, to what is normal. Siyempre, pag alam mo yung normal, it will be easy if you, it is it will be easy for you to know what is abnormality. What is an abnormality going on? Okay, what's what what problem is going on. Siyempre, because you know the basic foundation. Right? Pura ho kuda ng kuda dito. Diretso na nga tayo. Anyway, hello to Jane Catherine Aguilar. And hello to Princess Diana Dianalan. Okay. So, yun nga, no? Nervous system is one of the most complicated system in the body. So, what I'm going to do here, I will simplify nervous system in such a way that it can easily be understood. And um, I will only talk about things that I feel needed for your qualifying examination. May this qualifying examination pertains to the NCLEX RN exam or the NCLEX PN exam or the NLE, that's a nurse licensure examination in the Philippines, or may it be a form of DHA from metric, haad, name it, any nursing qualifying examination. Okay? So I hope this will help you guys. Hello to Alexis Balasa. So let's try to turn off the background music here. Exquisite shield. Okay, so let's talk about nervous system. Let's begin with the functions of the nervous system. So gito lang. Your nervous system serves three basic functions. And I hope you can remember this. Maybe yung iba dito alam nyo na, yung iba dito nakalimutan nyo na, but the moment I will explain it and run down it again, you can say, oh, I know that one. Kalimutan ko lang. Okay? So there are three basic functions of the nervous system. First is what we call the sensory function. Second is your integration function. And the third and the last function is your motor output. Okay? So let me try to share my screen and I will explain all those functions and okay, where is that? Share screen, entire screen, share there. What is this? Okay, here. So the nervous system. Your nervous system. Your nervous system serves three basic functions. Okay? First, it is important for sensory. Okay? Sensory. So when you say sensory, it is a type of nervous system function wherein uh, its relevance is that it will monitor changes that is happening inside and outside of the body. Okay? So that's the main that's the main uh, definition of a sensory function to monitor changes that is happening inside the body and changes happening outside the body. Now, why is it important for the nervous system to monitor those change or those changes in order for the body to adopt? Okay, why is it important for the body to adopt? Why is it important for the body to react to those stimuli? Why is it important for the body to react to those changes in order to establish a balance or we call it equilibrium, okay? So that's the first function, sensory. It monitors changes that is happening inside the body or outside the body, okay? Now, once those sensory structures was able to pick up that there's a change, there's a stimuli, it will send an impulse now to your brain, okay? And once an impulse reaches the brain, here comes the second function of your nervous system. And what is that? The second function of your nervous system is what we call integration. Integration. So when you say integration, it means to say that there is what they call processing. There is analysis. There is processing. So the brain now will analyze the impulse, will analyze, interpret, integrate the impulse sent 
by those sensory structures, by those sensory organs in the body. Okay, and out of those analysis, out of those integration, processing, interpretation, the brain now will formulate a response. And that response is the third function of your nervous system. And what is that? Motor output. Okay, third is your motor output. So what do you mean when you say motor output? Motor output refers to response, okay, response formulated by the brain with respect to the stimuli, with respect to, to the change, okay? So these are the three functions of the nervous system. Let me give you, let me give you an overview how the nervous system works, okay? Uh, how many of you here knows how to drive a car? Knows how to drive a car? Yeah, I know how to drive a car. Uh, pero hindi naman lahat marunong mag-drive ng, ano, mag-drive ng sasakyan. Uh, let's try to simplify that. Who among you here knows how to ride a bicycle? So lahat naman siguro, majority marunong mag- magbisikleta. Ano? So let's say you know how to drive your bicycle. And then I also assume that you know how to read traffic lights, right? You have color green, you have your color uh, yellow or orange, and then you have color red. Green means go, red means stop, yellow, orange means ready or warning, right? So those are three colors in the traffic light, okay? Now, let's say you're driving your new car or your new bicycle, and then there's a change in the color, okay? There's a change in the color. A change in the color is a stimuli, right? Now, question, what specific sensory structure in the body was able to monitor that there's a change in the color? Of course, your sensory structure, your sensory organ, your eyes, right? So your eyes was able to see that there's a change in the color, that the color changes from color green, it went to color uh, color yellow or orange, then it went, it changes to color red. But the problem there is your eyes doesn't know what those colors mean. So what will happen now is that your eyes will send an impulse to your brain and the brain will try to interpret that. So sasabihin ng, ng, sasabihin ng brain, ah, Mata, ang tawag dyan, traffic light. O, di parang nag-uusap sila, ano? So, sasabi ng mata, ah, traffic light yung tawag doon? Yes. So, sasabi ng brain, yung kulay kanina green, tapos nag-change to yellow, kay yellow or orange, now it, changed, it changes to, uh, it changed to color red. Red means stop. That is analysis. That is integration. That is processing. Okay? That is interpretation. Okay? That's your brain. Tapos sasabihin ng brain, don't worry eyes, gagawa ko ng paraan. Anong gagawin ng brain? Kasi ibig sabihin ng traffic light na yan, I stop, then I have to do something about it, right? Your brain now will command your hand to pull the handbrakes, okay? The right handbrake and the left handbrake. If you're, if you're riding your car, riding your bicycle, they will, key, of course, they will control the front and the rear tire, Okay. So what else? The brain now will command your, your your foot either right or left. Na remember, it's 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 a bicycle. Okay, kung hindi matutumbak ka, not unless yung bicycle mo may balancer. Alam yung balancer, yung bicycleta na may dalo may may excess na tire sa side para hindi ka matumbak. So sa bisaya pa mutukod ka para hindi ka matumbak. Right, that is the motor output. Okay. So the brain will formulate a response. And what is that? And what, what are those responses? Pull the handbrake okay, for you to stop because that, that, that should be your action if the, okay, if the color in the traffic light is red. So that's the motor output. Okay? So that's how nervous system works. So you have your sensory. Okay? You have your integration. Then you have your motor output. Okay? Now, if you go back to the basic, okay, when you say sensory, what do you think is the direction of your screen. What do you think is what do you think is the direction of your impulse transmission if it is sensory? Okay. What do you think is hello to Kelly Military Mom? Hi there. And hello to Carol Ernesta Lav Latouche. That's a nice, that's a nice name. Anyway, so when you say sensory, what do you think is the direction of your impulse transmission for sensory? Is it towards the brain or away from the brain? Okay, of course, it's away from the brain. Okay, when you say motor output, motor, sorry, I stand corrected. Sensory, the in, direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. Again, 
I want to correct myself. If it is sensory, the direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. For motor output, the direction of your impulse transmission is away from the brain. Okay? So again, sensory, the impulse, the direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. For motor, the, okay, the direction of your impulse transmission will be away from the brain. Okay? Simple as that. Let's go back. Again, there are three basic functions. Having said that, a patient with neurologic disorders, name it, any neurologic disorders, any neurologic disturbances will all will always have okay, one, two, or three manifestations. And what are those manifestations experienced by patient with neurologic disturbances? A patient with neurologic problem may have sensory deficit, may have motor deficit, or a combination of sensory and motor deficits. Have you noticed that? Right. Okay. Right. You're right. So all patients with neurologic problem may have sensory deficit, motor deficit, or a combination sensory and motor. That is why in your in your qualifying examination, all patients with neurologic problem, sensory problem, motor problem, one of your priority here is safety of your patient. Okay? So don't forget that. Okay? Now, so... Technically, when you talk about medical surgical nursing, we are actually focusing more on the sensory problem, motor problem, or a combination. It's, it, it, it's not about integration process because when you say integration or analysis, usually it falls under psychiatric nursing, right? So, ganun ba yun? Kaya nga, sometimes, yung mga sudyante, sir, bakit hindi na di-discuss yung concept na to, yung topic na to sa gritong concept? Kasi may mga partition. There is what we call division, Okay. There's always a partition. So if, if the problem is if the problem is sensory problem, motor problem, or combination, it's more on medical surgical nursing. But if it's about perception, for example, this is a this is actually a pen, right? This is a pen. But for a patient who is a psychiatric patient, this for, for, for that patient, it may not be a pen. There is a problem with analysis, perception. For for that patient, it could be a form of a sword. Or for, for, for other patients, it could be a snake. So there is a problem with analysis. So kaya nga may partition siya. Yung partition niya is psychiatric nursing. So for, for your medical surgical nursing, my focus will be sensory deficit, motor deficit, or a combination sensory and motor deficit. I hope that's clear. Anyway, hello to Lori May Bacon. Bacon! Aray. And hello to Joy Ed Luderes. Sir Joy Ed is also a, a review coach for the local examination in the Philippines. Hi, Sir Joy Ed. How's, how's everybody there? So that's it. Now, what else? When you say nervous system, the nervous system is actually divided into two classifications. Okay? Two classifications. So what are the two classifications of your nervous system? Okay? Classifications here. Classifications. Okay? First, we, we have this what we call structural classification. Okay. And number two is your functional functional classification. So, of course, when you say structural classification, we will discuss nerves, nervous system according to its structure. Okay. Functional classification, we will talk about nervous system according to its function. Right. So, we classify them into two so that it will be easy for us to understand. Okay. Why? Because nervous system is a big concept. Okay. Bakit pali it siya? Hold on. Let's do it like this. There. I think this one is better. Hold on. Let me check my monitor. Perfect. Okay. So when you say structural classification, nervous system is divided into two, whether it is a form of a CNS or a PNS. Okay, CNS and PNS are two structural classifications of the nervous system. CNS stands for central nervous system. PNS stands for peripheral nervous system. So when you talk about CNS, so if you happen to hear your lecturer, if you happen to hear your coach or whoever, your clinical instructors, if, you're, if somebody will tell you CNS, CNS, so don't forget that when, when they mention CNS, they are referring to brain and spinal cord. Okay, so under CNS, you have the brain. And then you have your spinal cord, brain, and spinal cord. So these are structures under CNS, okay? 
So sa mga sudyante ko yan, sa mga sudyante ko dyan, remember, I said, if I mention CNS, I am referring to brain and spinal cord. Okay? PNS, or peripheral nervous system, what are structures, what are structures under this classification? The PNS, you have your cranial nerves. Okay? You have your spinal nerves. You have your peripheral nerves. So these are your peripheral nervous systems. So don't forget this. If you're like, if you're coach, if you're, reviewer, if your teacher, if your professor, if your clinical instructor, if they would tell you CNS, PNS, so you know what they're referring about, okay? So CNS, brain and spinal cord, PNS, central, PNS, you have your cranial nerve, spinal nerve, and peripheral nerves, okay? Now, since we're talking about structural classification, don't forget this, that the basic structural unit in the nervous system are actually neurons, the nerves, okay? Nerves. Sir, may pinagkaiba ba? Is there a difference between neurons, okay, and neuroglia? Neuroglia. Yeah, there's a very big difference. They are not the same cells, okay? Neurons are special cells. Okay, you, you call this a sure nerve. Okay, neurons, nerves, okay? Neurons, nerves. These are special cells, okay? Why, why, why is it special? Because they have the ability to receive impulse, analyze impulse, and uh, transmit impulses, okay? Neuroglia, on the other hand, may look like a neuron, okay? Would you believe that? Neuroglia looks like a neuron, but it's not a neuron, okay? Neuroglia, you also call this a sure nerve glue. Nerve glue. Some book, it's not nerve glue. Uh, they call this as supporting cells. Supporting cells. Neuroglia, nerve glue, or supporting cells. They will protect neurons, okay? And there are different types of neuroglias, okay? Parami classic neuroglia. Now, neurons, as mentioned, is the basic structural unit of the nervous system, okay? Now, I mentioned that Neurons will receive impulse, transmit impulse, analyze impulse. In order to enhance impulse transmission, there is a protein, okay, that will enhance impulse transmission, and that is what you call the myelin, okay, myelin. Now, a myelin, okay, a myelin sheet, a myelin is essential because it will enhance, it will improve impulse transmission. Question, do we have myelin? Do we have myelin in the CNS? Yes, we do have myelin. Why? Because myelin, okay, because CNS has neurons. So if there are neurons, there are myelins in there, okay? So it will enhance or improve uh, impulse transmission. Do we have myelin in the PNS? Yes, we do, okay? So we have myelin in the CNS. We have myelin in the PNS. Now, who produces myelin? That depends. Are we talking about the CNS or we're talking about the PNS? So don't forget. Don't forget the mnemonic here in your qualifying examination, your COPS. So this is my technique, okay? Knowing what specific cell produces myelin. So C stands for CNS. P stands for PNS, okay? So pair yun sila. So what specific cell produces myelin in the CNS? It's O. O stands for what? O stands for oligodendrocytes. Oligodendrocytes, okay? Oligodendrocytes are cells that will produce myelin in the CNS. But for the PNS, it's letter S. S stands for what? S stands for Schwann cell. Schwann cell, okay? Your Schwann cell is a cell that will produce myelin in the PNS. And these two are examples of what we call neuroglia. Okay, now there are cases where in the myelin sheet is actually destroyed. Okay, there are cases where in the myelin sheet is damaged as a result. Once the myelin sheet is damaged or injured, it affects impulse transmission. Okay, so what do you call that problem where in there is disruption of the myelin? We call that condition as demyelination. Demyelination. So again, what is demyelination? Destruction of the myelin sheet. So we know for the fact that myelin is important for impulse transmission. So once the myelin is destroyed, it affects impulse transmission. So 
eventually will end up having some deficit, right? So the question here is, what is the disorder if the demyelination happens in the CNS? That is usually your multiple sclerosis. If the demyelination happens in the PNS, most often that is your GBS or your Guillain-Barré syndrome, okay? Your multiple sclerosis, your Guillain-Barré syndrome are examples of demyelination. So technically, these disorders will affect motor functioning of your patient, okay? So a patient with motor deficit will usually end up having respiratory problems. Usually, they will end up having respiratory issues, and usually that is the cause of death. Okay, so the question here, what causes demyelination? Actually, the exact cause is unknown. Okay, the exact cause is unknown. It's an autoimmune. Okay, it's an autoimmune. But one precursor for demyelination is an elevated immunoglobulin G, IgG elevation. So if there's too much IgG, okay, if there's too much immunoglobulin G, that is a precursor for demyelination. That is the thing that causes destruction of the myelin sheet. Okay, your IgG elevation. That is why if doctors suspect autoimmune, your MS, GBS, they will usually order electrophoresis of the CSF. They check CSF. If in the CSF of the patient, there is elevated IgG, they suspect demyelination. Okay, anyway, so that is for your structural classification. Then we will talk about functional classification. So under functional classification, there are two. Functional classification of the nervous system. I already mentioned this. You have your sensory, then you also have your motor function, right? Sensory, I said sensory means uh, the direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. Okay, motor, the impulse, the direction of your impulse transmission is away from the brain, okay? Other, okay, other medical surgical book or other anatomy book, by the way, uh, my source sa mga lecture ko po, yung source ng uh, lecture ko, dalawang book, yung usually ginagamit ko for anatomy physiology, I usually use the book of Marieb, and the other one is the book of Tortoro Grabowski. Okay, anyway, for sensory, you also call this a sure afferent nervous system. Okay, for motor, you also call this a sure efferent nervous system. Okay, so again, sensory, the direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. Motor, the direction for impulse transmission is away from the brain, okay? So let's try to identify what type of function is this. Is this sensory function or motor function? Touch, touch, that's sensory function. Blinking, that's motor function, okay? Uh, swallowing, that is motor function, right? Taste, that's sensory function, okay? I hope that's clear. Anyway, on, under motor function or efferent nervous system, it is actually subdivided into two. And what are this? You have here your voluntary nervous system, and then you also have your involuntary nervous system. So from the word itself, voluntary, these are motor activities. These are actions. These are activities that you can control, right? These are things that you're aware of. You can control them. Okay, that's your voluntary nervous system. When you say involuntary, these are activities, these are actions wherein you're not aware of it, you cannot control them. Example, heartbeat. You cannot tell your heart, heart, you know what? I'm so tired today. So can you take a rest? Can you contract tomorrow? We cannot do that, right? Because if you learn how to posture your heart, then you also appreciate rigor mortis. Can you follow? So that's your involuntary nervous system. By the way, involuntary, you also call this as your autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system. Okay, anyway, may mga nagpapabati. Hello to... Yung mga hindi ko pa nabasa dito. My God. Lori May, I'm done. Alicia Cria Amorato Magbanwa. Hi there. Hello to Abigail Vignalon, Richard Galliares, hi to Rochelle Esperat, Joanne, hi Joanne, Austria. Hello to PJ, CNS, hi there, Marco Rodriguez, hello, uh, Sheila Aiko and Katrina Hatap, and hello to Marcel Semana. Hello to Marco Lumba, kumusta ka? So anyway, so... When you say when you say autonomic or involuntary nervous system, it is again further subdivided into two. 
it is subdivided into two, whether it is a form of parasympathetic, and then you also have your sympathetic. Hello to Katrina Cody Hata Dikisan. Hi, sir, watching from Canada. Hi. How's everybody there in Canada? Hello to Marcel Joyce Semana. Hi, Sir John. Hello, Paul. Again, your involuntary or autonomic is subdivided into two. You have your parasympathetic, and then you have your sympathetic nervous system. Now, I need to I need to discuss this one because this is essential in your qualifying examination and, of course, in your in your in your pharmacology concept. Okay. Anyway, who do we have here? So let's talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic. So I'll put them in a table, and then I'll also incorporate pharmacology here, okay? So we have parasympathetic, parasympathetic. Then we have here sympathetic nervous system. Okay, question. When is parasympathetic activated? When can you see parasympathetic at rest? Am I right? Remember, if you're in the Philippines and you want the jeepney, if you want the taxi to pull over, what will you tell the driver? Para, para kuya, para. It means to say it will pull over at rest. Okay? If you ride a jeepney, what will you tell the driver to pull over? Para. It will pull over at rest. Sympathetic when will you have a sympathetic reaction during emergency, right? Emergency condition, right? Stress, diba? We say sympathetic, um, my technique here is simpa sipa. Okay? Pag sinipa ka, hindi ka ba na stress? Pag sinipa ka sa ulo, hindi ba emergency? Okay? So anyway, so parasympathetic happens if you're at rest. Simp that it happens, occurs during emergency condition, okay, stressful situation. Okay, next. Parasympathetic is also called rest and repair. Okay, other book, they call this as resting and digesting. Sympathetic, we call this fight or flight response. Fight or flight response. Now, what is so essential here for your qualified examination are actually the effects. Effects, okay? Now, parasympathetic at rest, what will happen to your vital signs? At rest, of course, vital signs will be low. What about your GIT and then your GUT? Gastrointestinal tract activity will be increased. Genital urinary tract activity will be increased. That is why we call it resting and digesting because there's increased GI activity. Okay? Sympathetic response is different. During emergency, your vital signs will bump, right? Will go up. Your vital signs will go up. Your heart rate will go up. Your blood pressure will shoot up. Vital signs will go up. And you cannot feel that you're hungry during emergency. So that is why GIT activity is low. GUT activity is also low. Okay, please do not forget their effects. Okay, next. Since in your parasympathetic, there's increased digestive uh, tract activity, expect that there will be increase in your mucus production. Okay, here... And you're sympathetic, there will be decreased mucus production. Next, in parasympathetic response, okay, what will happen to your pupils? What will happen to your pupils during parasympathetic response? The pupils will actually constrict. Okay, pupil con. Constriction. Now, what about the bronchial area? You will have bronchial what? Bronchial constriction or bronchial dilation? Your technique. Whatever is the movement of your pupils, that will be the same movement for the bronchial area. So, if you have pupil constriction, you will end up bronchial constriction. 
Okay, next. Since the vital signs are low, your blood pressure is low, so you will have vasodilation. What about on the other side? Here, sympathetic response during emergency, the pupils will dilate. Okay, pupils, you will have dilation, right? And I said same movement with the bronchial area. So you have bronchodilation. Vital signs are high, blood pressure is high, so the arteries will constrict. So you have vasoconstriction. Am I right? Now, what about what about erection? Can you tell me? Erection. Erection is parasympathetic or sympathetic response? Erection. Can you tell me if it's erection? Remember, parasympathetic happens when you're at rest. Okay? Sympathetic, it's emergency. Stressful situation. Okay? Can you tell me erection? Erection is what? Sympa or para? Please comment your answer. I want to I wanna see your answers below. Hello to Sir Roger Tong. And hi, sir. Hello to Dandy Ledesma. Can you tell me, nurses, erection? Erection is, is it parasympathetic or sympathetic response? Hello to Stephen Baiza. Erection. Erection. Parasympa. Parasympa. Erection. Walang sumasagot, ha? Ayan yung sumagot, ha? Remember, parasympathetic happens when you're at rest. Sympathetic response during emergency. Erection is... Hello? Oh, hello to Sir Oliver Parenas. Hi, sir. How's Hawaii? Okay. So, erection is actually parasympathetic. Okay? Hindi po siya sympathetic. Take note, sympathetic emergency situation. Stephen, wrong. It's para. Okay? Erection is parasympathetic. Ejaculation is sympathetic response. May erection ka ba nung nasunugan ka ng bahay? Nung hinabol ka ng aso, may erection ka ba? Okay? Anyway. Here. So, parasympathetic, you have erection. Erection. Sympathetic, you have ejaculation. Okay? Now, let's try to incorporate some medications here. Meds. Okay. What medication, once given to your patient will decrease the vital signs. Of course, you have your beta blockers. Am I right? So when you say beta blockers, beta blockers will decrease the vital signs. But take note, don't forget this in your qualifying exam. Your beta blocker will also cause bronchoconstriction. Am I right? That is why, don't forget this in your NCLEX, one of the fatal side effects, or to be specific, adverse effects, of beta blocker is that it causes bronchoconstriction. What, ma what, what makes it fatal? Bronchoconstriction can cause airway obstruction. Am I right? And take note, we do not give beta blockers to patient with asthma attack, patient with asthma. We don't give that. Okay? Because again, it worsens airway obstruction. Okay? That's your beta blocker. What medication here in sympathetic, once you give to your patient, will increase the vital signs? Okay? It's your epinephrine. Am I right? It's your epinephrine. Now, when you give epinephrine to your patient, by the way, what is another name of your epinephrine? You also call this as your adrenaline. Okay, anyway, when you give epinephrine to patient, the effect is what? Simpa or para? The effect is sympathetic. 
Am I right? It falls under sympathetic, right? That is why, what is the classification of epinephrine drug? Your epinephrine is a form of a sympathomimetic medication. In short, it mimics sympathetic effect. So when you give epinephrine, it mimics sympathetic reaction. It increases the vital signs. Okay? Now, take note. When you give epinephrine, it causes bronchodilation. That is why, if you can still remember, in your emergency nursing, a patient with severe allergic reaction, we give EpiPen. We give epinephrine. Am I right? Your EpiPen. Why do you have to give epinephrine during anaphylaxis? Because epinephrine will open the airway of your patient. Okay? Don't forget that. Okay? That is why, okay, if epinephrine is a sympathomimetic drug, okay, what is another name of epinephrine? Answer, adrenergic drug. Okay? Adrenergic drug and sympathomimetic drug, they are the same. Don't confuse yourself. Now, epinephrine will increase the vital signs. Beta blockers will decrease the vital signs. So technically, your beta blocker will block epinephrine. So what is the classification of a beta blocker drug? Beta blocker drug is a form of adrenergic blocking agent. It blocks adrenergic. I hope that makes sense. Anyway, what else? When, when, what medication is given to your patient in order to decrease mucus production? Of course, what is that medication? Your atropine. Okay. Your atropine is a form of anticholinergic. It's an anticholinergic. Your atropine will decrease mucus production. Remember, we give atropine to patient before surgery. It's a pre-op med, right? Why do you have to give atropine before surgery? To decrease mucus production. Because the moment you are undergoing a general surgery or a surgery that costs that a surgery we're in, the doctors will use a general anesthesia. It suppresses your coughing reflex. So as a result, when there's increased mucus production, Mucus will accumulate in the airway of the patient, increasing the risk of aspiration, increasing the risk of mucus accumulation, causing mucus plug, causing airway obstruction. And furthermore, because of mucus accumulation, it will also increase the risk of infection. That is why you have to give atropine before surgery to prevent those complications. Okay, it's helpful. Now, so atropine is a form of an anticholinergic. So what is the opposite of an anticholinergic? Of course, of course, your cholinergic drug. Okay, your cholinergic. Okay, give me an example of a cholinergic drug. Of course, your tensilon. Your tensilon is a cholinergic drug. If there's overdosage of tensilon, you call that your tensilon toxicity or you call that your cholinergic crisis. Now, what medication was given to your patient will constrict the pupils? What medication was given to your patient will dilate the pupils? I hope this is familiar with you guys. Now, I uh, have to be near to the camera. I want you to look at my mouth. I want you to look at my lips. Okay, look at me. Look at me. Look at my lips, the opening of my mouth. Myo. Myotic. Myo. Myotic. Mibria. Midria, midriatic. So tell me, myotic will constrict or dilate? Myotic will constrict the pupils. Midria, midria will dilate the pupils. I hope that makes sense. That will be helpful, guys. Okay? So let's go back. So for pupil constriction, this will be myotic. Okay, for your pupil dilation, this will be your midriatic. Okay, and of course, bronchodilation, you have your bronchodilators. So bronchodilators, remember there are different types of bronchodilators. We have some, I want you to see me guys. Now, remember in your in your pharmacology, there are different types of bronchodilators, right? You have santine derivative, you have your sympathomimetic. So when you give bronchodilators to your patient, they will mimic sympathetic response. Therefore, they will increase the heart rate. Am I right? That is why patient receiving bronchodilator, you watch out for insomnia, you watch out for nervousness, you watch out for tachycardia, you watch out for chest pain. 
Okay? Because again, they will increase the heart rate of your patient. Don't forget that in your qualifying exam. Okay? So again, so I just incorporated some pharmacology here. So your parasympathetic and then you have your sympathetic response. Okay. So we're done with your parasympathetic and sympathetic responses. More of more, more about parasympa in my actual review classes. Okay. Now let's go back. Disconnected. Oh. Connected. What's connected and disconnected? Anyway. So we're talking about nervous system. Don't forget the primary structure in your nervous system is actually the brain. Brain, okay, brain, okay, and our brain has several regions. There are actually four regions of the brain, okay? Can you still remember the different regions of the brain? There are actually four regions. First is the cerebrum, okay? Next is what we call the diencephalon. Then we have uh, the me the brainstem. Then we have the cerebellum. Okay, so cerebrum, diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. Now your diencephalon is divided into three. Okay, now what are the three divisions of your diencephalon? You have your thalamus. hypothalamus, and then we have the epithalamus. Thalamus. Your brainstem is divided into three. Oh, yes. And what are the three divisions of your brainstem? You have here the midbrain. You have your pons. And then we have the medulla or medulla oblongata. Okay, now I will not discuss them one by one in detail. I will just highlight important things to remember for this regions of the brain. Okay, so anyway, before I will discuss the different regions, I will show you where are those regions located. Okay. Okay, here. So this is the sagittal section of the brain. Okay, I hope you can see this one. So this is what we call the cerebrum. Okay, this is the largest region of the brain. Okay, this part here is what we call your diencephalon. Okay, the roof of your diencephalon is your thalamus. Thalamus is considered to be the roof. Roof. Below your thalamus is your hypothalamus, okay? And then you have your epithalamus. And by the way, this is what we call the pituitary gland, this part. Okay, so this is the second region. This is the diencephalon. And this is what we called the brainstem. Brainstem is divided into three. You have the midbrain, you have the pons, and you have your medulla or medulla oblongata. An extension of that is what we call the spinal cord. And this part here is what we call the cerebellum, okay? So again, these are the regions of the brain. Cerebrum, diencephalon, brainstem, and then you have your cerebellum. Okay, I hope you can see my cursor moving there on your screen as I point those different regions of the brain. Okay, so allow me to discuss those different regions and their importance as well. Hello to Raquel de Castro watching from Davao City. Okay, let's begin with the cerebrum. Okay, cerebrum is considered to be the largest region of the brain. Okay, and cerebrum is considered to be the seat of intelligence. Okay, 
seat of intelligence. And by the way, the cerebrum is actually divided into two hemispheres. Okay, so it has two hemispheres. So we have the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, or the right brain, and the other one is the left brain. And we know the basic about this. The right brain, okay, the right brain controls the left side of the body, and the left brain controls the right side of the body. That is why if you end up having, um, if you end up having, if you end up having right hemispheric stroke, right stroke, where in the right brain is affected, it causes paralysis on the opposite side of the body. It causes paralysis on the left side. But if you will have stroke or left hemispheric stroke, for that, for that matter, left hemispheric stroke can cause paralysis, motor de deficit on the right side of the body. Because again, the right brain controls the left side of the body. The left brain controls the other side of the body, the opposite side. Okay? We're talking about the body. And sa sobrang laki ng cerebrum, okay, sa sobrang laki ng cerebrum, the cerebrum is also divided into different regions, okay? What are the different regions of your cerebrum? So we have the frontal lobe. Then we have the parietal lobe. Then we have temporal lobe. And then we have your occipital lobe, okay? So where are those? So you have here your frontal lobe, parietal lobe, temporal lobe, and here the back is your occipital area. Okay, just a quick rundown. Your frontal lobe is important for critical thinking, analysis, calculation, judgment. Ano daw? Frontal lobe is important for critical thinking, analysis, judgment, calculation. That's your frontal lobe. That is why if you notice, if you'll be asked, what is the square root of 5 million point 36? What do you usually do? You point your frontal lobe. Uh, all right. Uh, let me think about it. Uh, so frontal lobe is important for critical thinking, analysis, calculation, judgment. Frontal lobe. Okay. It is also in the frontal lobe where you can find the area of Broca or Broca's area. What is area of Broca or Broca's area? Area of Broca or Broca's area is important for speech formation. Speech formation. Motor speech. Speech formation. It, if there is problem with the Broca's area or area of Broca, it can cause aphasia. What type of aphasia is that? That is what we call expressive aphasia. Okay? Temporal lobe on the other side here, other side and other side. Your temporal lobe is important for hearing. Okay, it is in the temporal lobe where you can find the area of Wernicke, okay, or Wernicke's area. Wernicke's area or area of Wernicke is important for speech understanding. Okay, so remember, Broca or area of Broca is speech formation. Wernicke or area of Wernicke is speech understanding. Ibig sabihin, you can hear me and you understand what I'm talking about. Any problem with the Wernicke's area will result again to aphasia. What type of aphasia is that? That is what we call receptive aphasia. Okay? So receptive aphasia, okay, and you have your expressive aphasia. So don't, don't, Nick, okay, don't, don't confuse yourself with this. Broca's area will eventually, any injury there will eventually cause expressive aphasia. Wernicke's area, any injury there will eventually cause receptive aphasia. If you have a combination, if you have these two occurring at the same time, if you have, good, okay, you have your expressive and receptive aphasia, we call that as your global aphasia. Okay, so don't forget this. Okay, receptive aphasia, global aphasia, and expressive aphasia. Then here is your parietal lobe. It's important for sensory motor. And here, posterior part, is your occipital area that's for vision. Okay, so those are the different uh, regions of the cerebrum. Okay, frontal lobe, temporal lobe, parietal lobe, and occipital lobe. Don't forget that. Okay, what else? Then we also have other region number two. We have here your diencephalon. Okay, remember I said there are three divisions of your diencephalon. You have your thalamus. You have your hypo, thalamus, 
and then you have your epithalamus. Okay? What I want to emphasize here is your hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is important. Why? Because it regulates... It regulates your pituitary gland. Okay? Your hypothalamus is also the thirst and satiety center. Your hypothalamus is also important for thermal regulation. Your hypothalamus is also important for pleasure. Okay? Part of your limbic system. Right? That is why, diba sabi nila, don't tell your partner, I love you with all of my heart wrong. It should have been, I love you with all of my hypothalamus for pleasure. Right? Okay, that's your hypothalamus. Another region of the brain, number three, is what we called the brainstem. Okay, again, the brainstem has three subdivisions. You have the midbrain. Then you have your pons. Then you have your medulla or medulla oblongata. Okay. What I want to emphasize here is the medulla or medulla oblongata. Don't forget this one. Medulla or medulla oblongata is the center. Okay. For respiration, center for blood pressure and heart rate regulation. Okay. What I mean with heart rate regulation is that it will increase the heart rate. It can cause tachycardia. It will decrease heart rate. It can cause bradycardia. Okay? But take note, medulla oblongata is the respiratory center in the brain. It's not the pons. The pons will help regulate respiration. Any injury, any damage, any depression in the medulla oblongata, surely you will die. You will die out of what? You will die out of cardiopulmonary arrest due to depression or damage in the medulla oblongata. What causes depression or damage in the medulla oblongata? Injury, that's one. Number two, overdosage of some uh, medications that can cause depression. Now, what medications can cause depression in the medulla oblongata? You have your abno. You know abno? These are what we call depressants. A stands for alcohol. Too much alcohol can cause depression. B stands for barbiturates. Barbiturates, okay. N stands for what? Narcotics. And O stands for opiates. So any overconsumption of these agents can cause depression in the medulla oblongata. Okay, so you have to watch out. If you give any of these medications, you have to watch out for depression. Okay, anyway. And of course, the last region of the brain, number four, is what we call the cerebellum, right? The cerebellum is considered to be little brain. It looks like a small brain. It looks like a small brain. And cerebellum is important for balance, not only balance, but also for coordination. But balance is more on where? Sa ear. Okay? It's more on coordination. But it also plays a vital role with balance. Okay, any injury or problem with, the, with cerebellum, it may cause ataxia. There are also a problem with your coordination. Okay, so those are four regions of the brain. Okay, balikan natin here. So again, these are the four regions of the brain. This is what we call the cerebrum. This is what we call the diencephalon. This part here is the brain stem. Okay, and this is what we call the cerebellum. It looks like a small brain. Okay, and again, 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 your cerebrum is divided into four different lobes. The frontal lobe, it is where you can find the area of Broca or Broca's area. The temporal lobe, it's for hearing. It's where you can find the area of Wernick or Wernick's area. This is your parietal lobe, and here is your occipital area. Occipital lobe, which is important for vision. Okay, and remember, I said that the cerebrum is divided into two hemispheres, the right hemisphere or right brain, left hemisphere or left brain, right? And I said that right brain controls the left side of the body and left brain controls the right side of the body, okay? Opposite side. Now, in order for the brain to function well, there must be sufficient, adequate blood supply. So the question here is, what specific vessels will supply blood to the brain? There are two main vessels that will supply blood to the brain. 
Okay, so for example, uh, let me use this one. Oh, okay. For example, this is the brain. Okay, this is the front part of the brain and this is the posterior part of the brain. Okay, the front part of the brain, 80% of it, 80% of the blood supply to the brain is actually uh, supplied by the internal carotid artery. Okay, so the internal carotid artery will supply front part of the brain, the anterior part of the brain, 80% of it. Okay, the posterior part of the brain, 20% of it, okay, 20% of the blood supply to the brain is being what? Given by the vertebral artery. So, ibig sabihin, anterior part of the brain is being supplied by the internal carotid artery. Posterior part of the brain, a remaining 20%, is actually supplied by the vertebral artery. When the internal carotid artery and your vertebral artery, when they get inside the cranial area, they will form circle of Willis. I hope that's familiar with you guys. Okay? That's it. And take note, the internal carotid artery, nakabrancha sa galing sa iorta. Am I right? That is why, if you notice, a patient with existing cardiac abnormality, just like your atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, or any atrial dysrhythmia, will always have a higher risk to have stroke. Why? Because if a patient has an AFib or a flutter or atrial dysrhythmia, there's a chance that the heart will throw thrombus or throm will throw clot. And when that clot enters the brain, it causes stroke. That is why a patient with AFib, a flutter, they will be given... Uh, what do you call this? They will be given prophylaxis. They have to take a blood thinner. Or if not a blood thinner, they will be given uh, an antiplatelet. One example of antiplatelet is your aspirin. Or if not a blood thinner, they will be given warfarin. They will be given uh, eliquis uh, in order to decrease the risk of clot formation. Okay? Anyway, let's go back. Any questions, guys? None. Hello to all my viewers there. Thank you so much for staying. Do you have any clarifications or questions? Hello to Wadaminati Watchers. No, you know. Watchers. Okay. Mga viewers natin. Hello to Samantha Scott. Hi there. Hey, how are you? Hello to Lala Maagad. Hello to Alina Lamis. Dina Toledo. Hey, Teng. Kumusta na? Donna Mabel. Hello to Adrian Hestopa. Kumusta ka na? Hello to Warledu. MJ Mercado, Mary V. Quezon, Mara Homok, Jane Fernandez. Hi there. Okay. Now, the brain, an extension of the brain is your spinal cord, right? So if this is your spinal cord, I'm almost done. Basic lang po. So if this is your brain, okay, an extension of the brain is what we call your spinal cord. Okay, this is your spinal cord. Your spinal cord is about 16 to 18 inches long. Your spinal cord connects the brain and the body. So any injury in the spinal cord will cut the connection of the brain. Am I right? And don't forget that spinal cord is actually the center of reflexes, of many reflexes. Okay, that's the center for many reflexes. Now, don't forget this in your examination. There is a condition called spinal shock. Now, what is spinal shock? Spinal shock means there, there is sudden loss of spinal cord functioning that's your spinal shock hindi po yung nagulat yung spine so what is spinal shock spinal shock means sudden cessation of spinal cord functioning so sometimes you'll be asked what is the best indicator that spinal shock exists answer there will be absence of reflexes okay remember spinal cord is the center for reflexes so spinal shock means loss of spinal cord functioning so technically technically there will be absence of reflexes Okay, now if your spinal cord, if you cut the spinal cord, it looks like this. Okay, please bear with my drawing. There is a letter H. It looks like a letter H in appearance inside. 
Oh my God, this bear with my drawing. Or a butterfly in appearance. Okay, let's say this is the anterior part of the cord. Okay, anterior part of the cord. This is the posterior part of the cord. Okay, now, don't forget this. There is a nerve connected in the anterior part of the cord. There is also another nerve connected in the posterior part of the cord. Remember the okay, remember remember sensory and motor I mentioned a while ago. Sensory, the direction of your impulse transmission is towards the brain. For motor, the direction of your impulse transmission is away from the brain. The question now is, what specific nerve is connected in the anterior part of the cord? Is it the sensory nerve or the motor nerve? If it is anterior part of the cord, if it is posterior part of the cord at the back part, what nerve is connected there? Is it sensory nerve or motor nerve? My technique is MAPS. That's my mnemonic. MAPS. Okay? Anterior, posterior. Hati naman sila. So anterior part, this is the motor nerve. Okay? If it is motor nerve, the direction of your impulse transmission is away from the brain. For the posterior part, this will be sensory. If it is sensory, the direction of your impulse transmission is going to the brain. And guess what? When this motor nerve gets K, leaves the spinal cord, when this posterior nerve leaves the spinal cord, K, ang tawag natin sa kanya ay spinal nerve. So a spinal nerve contains sensory nerve and a motor nerve. Okay? So a spinal nerve contains sensory and motor nerve. Don't forget that. Now, uh, one common problem when you talk about spinal cord is, of course, SCI, or we call that a short spinal cord injury. Spinal cord injury happens, uh, or not happens, spinal cord injury, the common sites of SCI uh, will be cervical 5, 6, 7, thoracic 12, and lumbar 1. Those are common sites of SCI. Again, cervical 5, 6, 7, T12, and L1. Thoracic 12 L1. Why is it that those are common sites of SEI? Because those are area with great degree of movement or flexion. So if there's increased movement or flexion, there will always be subject for injury. Okay? And take note. A spinal cord injury above T6. Okay? Above T6, for example. So let's say this is the cervical. How many cervical vertebrae we have? Cervical, we have seven. Then we have thoracic 12. Am I right? Lumbar. Okay. We have 5. Correct? Then we have sacral area. Okay. 5 fused to 1. Okay. Then we have your coccyx. Okay. 3 fused to 1. Lima na pinag isa. Tatlo na pinag isa. Okay. Anyway, some book, the cervical vertebrae has 8. So, which is correct, sir? Seven or eight? They're both correct. If you happen to see cervical eight, it means to say they include the first pair here, and we call that as your atlas and axis, right? The atlas and axis. So, if they include the atlas and axis accounting, that would be cervical eight. Okay, but anyway, so if you have spinal cord injury T6 and above, thoracic six and above, it will increase the risk of what we call autonomic. Autonomic dysreflexia. Or some book we call this as autonomic hyperreflexia. So don't forget that. Autonomic dysreflexia, autonomic hyperreflexia is common to patients with SCI above T6. I will not discuss that in detail. That will be for medical surgical nursing. Okay? But anyway, so mga naging sujanti ko na discuss na natin to lahat. Okay, so that's the importance of our spinal cord. It connects the brain and the body. Now, in order for this uh, CNS to be protected, there are several layers or coverings of the CNS, and this will be my last topic. Okay, what are the different coverings or layers? Coverings, or shall I say protection? Okay, of course, you have your scalp. Okay, number two, you have your scalp. Skull. Okay? You have your scalp, then you have your skull. So don't forget this. When you talk about skull, one common problem issue here is fracture. Okay? So if you have anterior, anterior cranial fracture, then we also have uh, basilar fracture. 
Then we also have another issue uh, na common na lumalabas sa exam, Platibasha. Anyway, so anterior cranial fracture will result to CSF leakage in the nose or sometimes it may cause CSF leakage in the ears. So in the nose, we call that ashurinoria. In the ears, we call that otoria. Now, normally the CSF is clear, okay? But if the CSF bloody, it means to say there is bleeding. Now, a patient with CSF leakage, or if you suspect CSF leakage, the first action there is to check for glucose content, okay? Is it normal to find glucose in the CSF? Yes, your CSF contains glucose, okay? But if, you, if you're living in a far, 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 far flung area wherein there is no way for you to check glucose content in the CSF, one way to check is you get the clean white cloth, you wipe it, let it dry, and the CSF, the glucose in the CSF will leave a yellow halo markings, and that yellow halo markings, that's glucose, then you would suspect that is CSF leakage. Okay, so again, if you suspect CSF leakage, one nursing responsibility here is to check for glucose content. Next, a patient with an anterior cranial fracture will also develop a bluish discoloration surrounding the eyes of the patient. We call this a sure periorbital hematoma, or sometimes we call this a sure raccoon's eye. Okay, periorbital hematoma, or sometimes we call it as raccoon's eye. For a patient with basilar fracture, patient may also end up having CSF leakage. It could be uh, CSF leakage in the ears or sometimes in the nose as well. So again, okay, ears, so you call that a short otoria. Okay, nose, you call that rhinoria. So, okay, next, a patient with basilar fracture may also have bluish discoloration behind the ears of the patient. We don't call that raccoon's ears. We call that a sure what? Battle's sign, okay? So battle sign means bluish discoloration behind the ears that is usually present to patient with uh, basilar fracture. Platibasha, on the other hand, is another skull abnormality wherein there is invagination or sometimes they call it flattening of the base of the skull, okay? Now, is, there, is it an emergency condition? Yes, it is. Why? Because it, this platibasha will restrict, will compress the, the, the brain of the patient. And uh, this condition will eventually cause mental retardation. It may cause seizures. Okay, it may cause ataxia. So that, that's what that, that, that condition is what we call platibasha. Next, number three, another protection covering of the brain. You have the BBB, you know, BBB, basta bading bonga, no blood brain barrier. This is actually a network of capillaries. Okay filtering the blood to the brain. So it filters the blood, making sure that the blood has no impurities, okay, so that when the blood enters the, the, the brain of the patient, it's it's safe, okay? But it's not to say if, if in too much, if the content is too much, too much microorganism, too much alcohol, the blood-brain barrier cannot filter them, they can penetrate, so they can reach the brain. That is why if there's too much alcohol in the body, if the alcohol level is greater than 0.1%, if there's alcohol toxicity, it can penetrate the blood-brain barrier. It may affect your mentation. It may affect your motor, motor functioning. And if there's too much, uh, if there's septicemia infection in the blood, there's also a risk that it can penetrate the blood-brain barrier and infection there, it may spread into the brain of the patient, causing encephalitis, okay? Causing more problem, okay? Anyway, that's your blood-brain barrier. Another protection covering of the brain is, of course, your meninges. Meninges. Your meninges, these are actually layers, protective layers, and it comes with three layers. You have your DAP. DAP. I hope you're, you're familiar with this. They come in order. You have your dura. Then you have your arachnoid. Then you have your pia. Your dura mater is the outermost layer. The arachnoid is the middle. Under your arachnoid, there is a space. So, for example, this is your brain. Okay? So, this is the dura. Then you have your arachnoid. Then here is your pia. So, this is your dura. Then this is your arachnoid. Then this is your pia. See, if you notice, among the membranes of the meninges, it is the pia membrane that adheres closely to your brain. Okay? Underneath your clothes by Shakira, no, underneath your arachnoid, there's a space. You call this space as what we call subarachnoid space. Okay. And here you have your fluid 
surrounding the brain and spinal cord, and you call that as your CSF or your cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, we'll discuss that in a bit. Now, anyway, your meninges, it's a protective layer of the brain and spinal cord, right? Now, any inflammation, infection, or irritation in the meninges, we call that meningitis or meningeal irritation. And a patient with meningeal irritation will end up having different signs and symptoms, right? And I believe you know this one. A patient with meningeal irritation, a patient with meningitis or meningeal irritation, earliest sign is your nuchal rigidity, okay, stiffness, okay? Not only meningeal not only nuchal rigidity, a patient with meningitis will also end up having opistotonus or arcing of the body. Patient will have nausea, vomiting. Patient will have positive for Brudzinski sign. Patient will end up have pos having positive for Koenig sign. You know, uh, Brudzinski, B, batok, flexion of the neck, leads to flexion of the hip and knee. Koenig sign, K for knee, you know. Okay, so when you extend the knee, there is pain, Okay. So those are common presentations of a patient. Now, another protection covering of the brain, okay, brain and the spinal cord is your, of course, number five is your, your CSF, your cerebrospinal fluid. Now, don't forget this. What specific structure produced CSF? Okay, and who absorbs CSF? Who is responsible for CSF absorption? Okay, CSF is actually produced by your choroid plexus. CSF is being absorbed by arachnoid villi. Okay, now. So your CSF is a fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. It serves as a cushion. It serves as a cushion, protects the brain and the spinal cord so that if you're going to jump, it protects the brain, okay? It protects the brain and the spinal cord. It serves as a cushion. Now, there's a structure in the spaces in the brain. Normal for that in the brain, there are hollow spaces. We call them as your ventricles. Now, there's such thing as what you call lateral ventricle, third ventricle of the brain. Now, in, in those ventricles, there are a network of capillaries. We call those as your, your choroid plexus, and they are responsible in producing the CSF. So once the CSF is produced, there must be somebody out there that will absorb the CSF because if nobody absorbs the CSF, there is continuous production of the CSF. CSF will increase its volume. That will increase the ICP and that will give you another problem. So a, a, a structure that absorbs the CSF is your arachnoid villi. Okay. Now what is a normal CSF characteristic? The CSF, as mentioned, it is actually clear. Any, any blood or a bloody CSF is an abnormality. It means to say that there is what we call bleeding. Okay, and the volume of your CSF, the normal volume is about 150 ml. If there's too much CSF in the brain, that will give you a condition called hydrocephalus that will also increase the ICP of your patient. Okay, now what else? Uh, the CSF must be clear, colorless. I said that there should be no RBC in the CSF. Uh, Immunoglobulin in the CSS, CSF is about 3 to 12%. More than 12% indicates infection. Protein in the CSF is about 15 to 45. More than 45 indicates infection. Um, what else? Um, what else? WBC, uh, about 0 to 3 or 0 to 5. More than indicates infection. Okay? So those are normal characteristics of our CSF. Now, uh, there is a test done in in order to check any uh, CNS abnormality, wherein the doctor will pop the lumbar area and aspirate CSF. That's what we call lumbar topping or spinal topping. Don't forget this in your qualifying examination that lumbar topping, spinal topping is contraindicated to patient with increased ICP. Why? Because if the if the if the if the intracranial if the intracranial pressure, okay, ganon ako pag naglalakso no minsan pag nasapik ako ng Nasa momentum ako, sagta ko ng salita, minsan nabubulol ako. Yung mga sadyante ko, tawa na rin ang tawa. If the intracranial pressure is so high, and then you do lumbar topping or lumbar puncture, there's sudden release of pressure. It will, the patient will end up having, uh, what do you call this, herniation, cerebral herniation. So we're not supposed to do that. Okay? So uh, that is why I never do lumbar topping, spinal topping to patient with increased ICP. 
Okay, so what will you do if there's increased ICP? You have to treat what causes increased ICP. Now, the normal ICP is 8 to 15. 8 to 1, 5. Okay, 8 to 15. Other book, 10 to 15. Hindi po siya 10 to 21. 10 to 21 is intraocular pressure. Now, 8 to 15 millimeter, 8 to 15 millimeters mercury. That is the normal intracranial pressure. Now, there are a lot of factors that will affect ICP. Okay, first is the CSF volume. Number two is your blood volume, normal blood in the brain. Normally in the brain, we have about 100 to 150 ml of blood. So if there's too much blood in the brain because of intracranial bleeding, there's a ruptured cerebral vessel, or there is injury okay, it, that causes bleeding inside intracranially, so that will increase ICP. Okay, Or another factor that will affect ICP is the brain tissue, the brain mass. The brain, an adult, an adult average brain is about 1,400 ml. So there's increase in the brain mass, a brain volume. For example, there is development of a brain tumor. There is a new tissue, new growth that grows inside the brain. So that will increase the brain mass. So more than 1,400 ml. Then that will also increase the ICP of your patient. So again, there are three factors that will affect intracranial pressure, the brain volume, the blood volume, and the CSF volume. Okay, Those factors will affect intracranial pressure. And guess what? What's good about these three factors, these three elements, is that they help one another. If one is high, the other will compensate, okay, just to establish a normal ICP. And in your, in your anatomy physiology, we call that a sure Monroe Kelly doctrine or Monroe Kelly hypothesis. Okay, Monroe Kelly doctrine or Monroe Kelly hypothesis. What is this? It is a it is a doctrine that states that an increase in one element is compensated by other element. Okay. So again, that's your Monroe Kelly doctrine or Monroe Kelly hypothesis. One of the most important things to remember as a nurse for a patient with increased ICP is that positioning. Make it sure that the head of the patient's bed is elevated to promote penis return. And make it sure that the head of the patient is in neutral position, center, not facing on the sides. Because if you let the patient face on the side, what will happen? Facing on the side will, will impede venous return because if you let the patient face on the side or his or her side, it will compress the blood vessels on the sides of the neck. Compressing the blood vessels on the sides of the neck will impede venous return. Blood will congest in the upper part, which will increase intracranial pressure. Okay, that's it. Anyway, I hope that will give will refresh you about your nervous system. And I hope that will help you with whatever qualifying examination that you're planning to take in the near, near, near future. Okay, I think that's all, guys. Thank you so much for staying. If you reached this far, thank you. Thank you so much. At least wala na akong utang, ano? Ano ba kasi ba't hindi ba yung upload kahapon? Anyway, thank you so much for staying, guys. I hope you learned something. God bless everybody. Thank you so much. Keep safe. And I hope to see you soon. God bless. Bye.